Thanks for joining us for another installment of our video feature series, Explore the Riverbend. We're going to take you on a trip through the area's great natural attractions, explore our own urban legends, and highlight the small businesses that we visit day to day, and shed some light on the services that we might not otherwise think about. So come with us as we explore the riverbend. The Wood River Massacre was part of the War of 1812. It happened on July 10th, 1814. The war did not end until 1815. Now, if you lived during that time, you didn't call it the War of 1812. It's called the War of 12. The event is known as the Wood River Massacre or the Wood River Tragedy, but it did not happen in the city of Wood River. Wood River was not even formed at that time, nor was even Illinois a state at that time. But it was the Wood River and the, um, the forks that came up east and west, it happened in the center of those forks, which is approximately where Fosterburg is. So it's important to know that this isn't really the Wood River, the city of Wood River. This is the Wood River as in the body of water that used to be a fairly decent sized body of water. There are about eight to 10 families living in the boundaries of the Eastern Wood River and the Western Wood River branch. The Wood River Township was not around until 1875. The Moore family, there was three Moores living in this, it was called the Moore Settlement because of the three Moore families. There was William and Polly Moore, Abel and Mary Moore, and George Moore. And they all lived within a mile or two of each other, so it wasn't a far distance between cabins. Now, when they settled in 1809, that's when they came to the area. The Indians were not too much in an uprising then. It didn't start until the War of 1812 started. There were a lot of family members related to each other. Polly Moore was related, was a sister of Rachel Regan. And the recent Regan was her husband. And she was the one adult that was killed in the massacre. She was 24 years old. And Hannah Bates was a survivor of the Wood River Massacre. She was a sister of Mary and Abel Moore, of Mary Moore. They were all going to meet at Abel's house that night for supper. Now this is when the the um, whole incident started. Rachel wanted to go back to her cabin for green beans for the supper and bring them back. Another story is she was just going home. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. Her husband went to church out where, um, real close to Basalto Airport is today. So he's gonna be home soon. She took with her, her two children, Elizabeth or Betsy was seven and Timothy was three. She had William and Polly's two sons, John and George, and she had Abel and Mary's two sons, Joel and William. And also the 15-year-old Hannah Bates went along. Somewhere along the way, Hannah Bates turned around and went back. She either had a blister on her foot, which was hurting her, or she had a premonition something bad was going to happen. She was, you might want to call her the survivor of it, but she never witnessed anything. The family, the children never came back, so they all started looking for them. Now, the Indians, a band, I've, I've read anywhere from seven to 11 Indians attacked. They were all scalped, they were all stripped of their clothing, and they all had gash wounds on either side of their face from the tomahawk. When they found the body, William came back from camp. He was stationed at Fort Butler, but he came home for the weekend to see how his family was doing. He went to his home, no one was there. So he went on to Abel's house where he thought for sure they were all gathered. He found a body lying on the, on the ground. He didn't even know if it was a male or female. He had no idea who it was, but he knew Indians had killed the person. So he went up to Abel's house and spread the alarm that ending attack was on. Now you have to remember back then, it's pitch dark. If you didn't have a full moon, you couldn't see the hand in front of your face on a small trail. So when I first heard he didn't even know if it was a male or female, who it was, it was hard to believe. But it was so different then than what it is now. This was not an isolated incident. Um, the American Indians were with the British in the War of 1812 against the United States. And so the British were encouraging local tribes to 
to start these sort of incidents between them and the settlers that lived in the area. So nothing had happened in a couple of years. For the first couple of years of, of the War of 1812, people in this area were really worried about Native American attacks. Um, they tried to stay in block houses. They stayed with their neighbors. They're always making sure they knew what was going on in the area. But by 1814, everything was a little more relaxed. And so Rachel and these children went off to um, her house from a neighbor's house that they were staying at. And on the way is when this slaughter happened. You know, I'm not really uh, condoning what the Indians had done. But you know, you kind of you kind of got to step back and you got to look at uh, the big picture of what was going on in the world, uh, especially you know in the United States with the Indians getting pushed back to the uh, the Mississippi River. Um, you know, I guess we've got about 18 states now in 1814. Um, Indiana and Illinois will soon be states. Right now, they're just territories. But, you know, the Indians have been pushed all the way back up against the, uh, the Mississippi River. They've been pushed out of the south, so to speak. And uh, I guess they feel like, you know, this is going to be the last hurrah. This is the last ditch effort. It wouldn't be long. You know, the 1800s was kind of the, uh, kind of the beginning of the end for the Indians. Uh, it wouldn't be long until they were pushed into, like, Kansas. And then pretty soon they all ended up in Oklahoma. So uh, this was kind of the, the beginning and the end for them, and I, they, you know, they had to know that, I would imagine. The families were all at the Black House. They didn't know how many Indians were out there. They didn't know who else was getting killed. They left their babies out there on that path. That must have been beyond my imagination that night, staying in the Black House, knowing your dead children were out there. And they knew what animals did to cadavers. Who knows what they were going to find in the morning? Sun, sun comes up, they all rush out, they find the bodies, and the boys were strewn along the path as if they were trying to run away. Um, Isaac Prickett, no, Pruitt, Isaac Pruitt, he stayed back and helped bury the people, which was out at Vaughn Cemetery. It was once called the Old Pioneer Cemetery, next to the Baptist Church where uh, Mr. Reagan was that night. Uh, in the meanwhile, the rangers were in pursuit of the Indians. I don't think that we have any idea exactly what tribe the Indians were from. It's thought that they could have been the Putawa tribe, which we know as the Potawatomi, or the Kickapoos. But there were so many different tribes in that area at that time, we're really unsure of even who, who it was that they were chasing. So they were in pursuit for after the Indians an entire day, and then come close to dusk the next day, they spotted them. And at that point, the Indians separated, thus the rangers separated too to follow them. My ancestors, James and Abraham Pruitt, were two of a group of three that pursued a particular Indian. James had a fast horse. He was a great shot. He was able to shoot the Indian in the thigh. However, by the time they were able to get up 30 yards up there, the Indian had already gotten off of his horse and climbed up into a tree and Abraham Pruitt was able to shoot him, however, and kill him. And it was said that when they went through the Indian's horse and the pouches and the things that were on it and on his body, that they did find the scalp of Rachel Reagan inside. So they knew that they had actually apprehended the correct culprits of the crime. The other Indians were also caught by the various different rangers. One Indian, however, was able to escape, and he did so by diving into a water. Now, there's an obelisk that was erected in 1910 from the descendants of the Moors off of Fosterburg Road, right by Hilltop Auction House. That was on the path that Rachel took. And on the obelisk, it says, 
The massacre happened 300 yards behind that statue, that monument. But what is behind? I mean, it's a square monument. One of the most important things that keeps our, our focus on history is to have something really physical to hold on to. And there are so many artifacts that survive from the Wood River Massacre. Cemetery, the cemetery that they're buried in is still in existence. There are tombstones both there and at the Alton Museum of History of Art. Um, and there's a large monument that people can go to and see. So you're, you're not just thinking about this as history, you're there with, with the people who died. Well, I mean, it's uh, obviously it was a pretty great, tra you know, it was a great tragedy for uh, the people that were trying to establish a, a life here. You know, uh, I guess a young mother and uh, what, six children, six very small children, uh, brutally murdered by uh, Indians. You know, they were scalped. Uh, who knows what else? You know, we really don't know. But, uh, you know, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty rough to uh, have to live with that. I think it stands out, number one, because it was such a horrific incident. I mean, Indian scalping, that's something nobody really, that's all, that happened out west. It didn't happen here. And the War of 1812 is brought in. That, people don't realize how involved we were in that war. I think the main reason, though, it's such a gory, horrible story, and I think those, the worst ones, are the ones that get told over and over again. It happened to children, that it was six children, ages 10 and under, that were just cold-blooded murdered, and a young mother. And in our culture, that's unheard of. That's, that's an unspeakable crime that you do not commit against someone. So, so I think that's part of it, the fact that it's children. And I think another part is that the relatives of those people have remained in this area for, for decades and for decades. It's been published in newspapers. Uh, there have been dedication ceremonies. There are two monuments, one off Fosterburg Road, one off of 140 and then the monument at the Von Hill Cemetery. So I think there's been a lot of publicity about it because it does interest people to know that something of that horrific nature happened in this area. We hope you enjoyed this installment of Explore the Riverbend. Be sure to read the accompanying article for more information.